How does stop? Stay there. Um, how does book four immediately differ from the previous three? We don't start from Harry's point of view. We don't start from Harry's point of view. No, well, book one doesn't one. start from Harry's point of view. We see. We see. I get what you. I, I'm, I'm sorry. It's where it Where are we? It doesn't start at the Dursleys. Okay. One through three all begin at number four, Privet Drive. Number four begins at the Riddle House. Why? Why does she make that change seemingly mid-series? Book five is going to begin at number four, Privet Drive. Book six. I was just standing up when I wrote this down. I'm trying to remember. Either six or seven. I think seven does and six. I can't remember. Anyways, I think the show transition from because like this is kind of the start of the transition into like the real meat of the story. So what I'm guessing is, is that this is like showing the start of that transition. Okay. It's a little bit of a darker book. The more you get into a little it. bit. Um, <laughs> it's, it's more of a darker book. We're gonna talk about you know a lot of stuff it. in it. So so maybe she's trying to show that. This is where we could need to fully start paying attention, possibly. I mean, what are we going to see in the first chapter? Um, it's the first one we're going to see. A murder. Someone getting killed. Yeah. We're going to see a murder. Okay. And we're going to hear, before that murder, about a murder that occurred seemingly very recently. Bertha Jorkins. Okay. So, opening chapter, we witness Avada Kedavra. We've never seen Avada Kedavra before. We've heard about it. We've heard about a mass murder in the third book. Um, but, I mean, she just drops us right, right into it in this first chapter. I'm trying to think how to put this. What is that kind of an indication of? And I think you got, you hinted at it. I think it was you. Why didn't you? Um, it, it's kind of like within the fantasy realm, within the, the Hogwarts magical world, we're getting to the real world. This is real world kind of stuff. This isn't, you know, oh, a magical, mystical, hidden chamber whether book one or the Chamber of Secrets book two, or this isn't, you know, some hidden dark secret, you know, about somebody not really being a killer, blah, 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 blah. This, this is kind of more grown up stuff, right? How old are they? They're 14. Some people would say, many people do say, they're still children. They have to be protected. While others would say, you know, you're able to endure some things at 14. You're able to hear some things. You're able to see some things. A lot of kids have seen things by 14, you know, that a lot of older people will never kind of see. Okay? So, <clears throat> what do we see happen in the first chapter, other than the murder that I've referred to? Who, who do we see? Who are the characters? Frank Price, not in the first chapter. Wormtail. Voldemort, Nagini, okay? It's in Little Hangleton, and we're at the Riddle House, right? How long has Frank Bryce been at the Riddle House as caretaker? Over 50 years. He was the one who was originally blamed for the murders of the Riddles at the Riddle House, okay? Which we get more information about that in book six, right? So, what are Wormtail and Voldemort doing at Voldemort's old home? The place he grew up, not really. <laughs> His mother's, no, not really. His father's old home. What are they doing there? 
Are they just hanging out? Is this like, you know, somewhere in the country? They're planning. For? Um, what do you want me to say? <laughs> They're planning their plot. They're plotting to get Harry Potter. Okay? Page 8. Wormtail. Your lordship is still determined then. Duh. It could be done without Harry Potter. Hmm, without Harry Potter. I, I don't say this out of concern for the boy. <coughs> so, no concern for the boy. The boy is nothing to me. Two. Nothing at all. Three. Why three times does Wormtail say, the boy needs nothing? Means, man, been doing that all morning. Means nothing to me. Means nothing to me. What did Dumbledore tell Harry at the end of the previous book? There is a connection now between you and Wormtail. One that Wormtail didn't want and one that he is sure Voldemort doesn't want. Okay? This is Wormtail emphasizing, I don't care anything about this kid. All right? So, why does he say we can use another wizard? We can use any wizard. The thing can be done so much more quickly. Now, we don't know what the thing is, and when we get to the end of the chapter, we still don't know what the thing is. Other than, Voldemort says, hmm, I can use another wizard. Wormtail, top of page nine. It makes sense. Laying hands on Harry Potter would be so difficult. He is so well protected. What does he mean by laying hands on? Touching him. Say that again. Touching him. Touching him? I mean, that's literally what laying hands on means. What one word do we use to describe that action? Having? No. See, it's interesting. I've asked that question this class and my previous class, and nobody came up with this one word. It's a word that's used every day in America because it happens every day in America. And yet none of you have picked up on it. And it's not because of you. It's because... It's because she, used, she chose this phrase, laying hands on. And I don't know if that's a Britishism for another phrase that we use in America, or she is intentionally using what I think is religious language. Is it kidnapping? Yes, it's kidnapping. <laughs> kidnapping Harry Potter would be so difficult. That's what is meant. Okay? Or, one of my previous students pointed out, maybe she's really talking about laying hands on because of what happened to Quirrell. Okay? So how is laying hands on religious language, as I just kind of blurted out? Anybody know? Because that's how priests bless people. It's how priests can bless people. It's how, within some communities in the Christian tradition, healing is done. You lay hands on somebody. The book of James talks about healing. And you get seven priests together and they lay hands or elders they lay hands on the person it's interesting she uses that language because in a later book and I'm right in my brain it's either book 6 or book 7 we're going to find out until someone is done converting somebody else that's the actual word she uses okay converting unless you're talking about converting you know an outlet from 110 Volt to 220 volts, that word is not used really except in one other context, and that's a religious context. Because if you switch political parties, you switch political parties. You don't convert from being a Republican to a Democrat. Conversion involves what? It's kind of a whole person. <coughs> And yet, she uses that language to describe somebody who is working on converting another character. Okay? So, laying hands on would be so difficult. He is so well protected. Now, a student in my first class said, yeah, but that could be how is he protected? 
Harry's mother died to protect him, right? He's got that love charm, so to speak, which the Voldemort in book two, once it was explained to him, went, duh, I should have realized that. So does that mean if Voldemort were to have appeared in book three, he wouldn't be able to go up and touch Harry? Hmm. Yeah, it probably does, by the way, because of something we're going to see happen at the end of this book. So, and so you volunteer to go and fetch and give me a substitute. Right? He said, any witch, any wizard. Okay? He said, I, I won't, I'll be back quicker than flash. My devotion to you, my lord. Your devotion is nothing more than cowardice. You would not be here if you had anywhere else to go. Okay? Which is also kind of what Sirius and Lupin said in the previous book. In other words, if you could get something out of it not being here, you would be somewhere else. Okay? Voldemort, top of page 10. I have my reason for using the boy as, I've, as I have already explained to you. So here's a question for you. Do you think Voldemort has explained all of the reasons for why he wants to use Harry to worm tail? I'm seeing heads go like this. Why not? Where is Wormtail on the hierarchy of Voldemort supporters? He's pretty low down there. He happens also to be the only one that Voldemort, you know, at this point, kind of can trust. Okay? So, he says, as for the protection surrounding the boy, I believe my plan will be effective. The, the plan there, two elements. Okay? One, for getting the boy... Harry, and two, what he's going to do with him once he has him. Right. That's why he needs Harry. Could they use anybody? Is Wormtail right? Yes, they could. We're going to be told later on, I'm jumping way, 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 way forward. Sorry to give it away. Um, what's required in the spell to bring Voldemort back? Blood of an enemy. Guess what? If we were in the magical world, well, I'm assuming this, sorry, maybe some of you are hidden Voldemort supporters, we would all be enemies of Voldemort. More than likely. And I know there's probably one or two true blooded Slytherins in here, there always is. <laughs> <laughs> Etc. Okay? <clears throat> so, he says, all I need is a little courage. Come on, come on. Thought I saw him up there. So he says, Bertha Jorkins's, he, Wormtail, disappearance will not go unnoticed. If I murder, if we proceed, and if I murder, who? I don't think I've ever emphasized that part before, which means I'm going to get behind. <laughs> uh, who do you think I'm murdering? I mean, this is on a question. Harry? Wormtail? Wormtail's the one speaking. Oh. If I kill myself? No, that doesn't work. Who's he going to murder? Is he going to murder Harry? I don't know. Not within the context of the novel. Okay, anyway, just let that hang there for a bit. Um, they go back and forth. Frank Bryce comes in. He interrupts. And we see Frank Bryce killed. Okay. Why? Why kill Frank Price? Stay there. Because he was eavesdropping on conversation. And? He knows their secret. And? He's evil. And? It's a good answer. <laughs> Those are good answers. And? Why not? <laughs> He's bored. Mm -hmm. I mean, really, why not? If you're Voldemort, killing is like what? It's like breathing. We're going to be told later on in the chapter, the dark mark, that in the past, most of the killings of muggles were done for what? Fun. Fun. Okay. So, Harry wakes up, scars hurting, kind of remembers portions of the dream. 
What does he do? We're not spending long in this chapter. We're going to zip. We're going to get to like chapter 15. <laughs> What's he do? Okay, he writes the series, but only after thinking what should he do, and he thinks, let's see, I can write to Ron, right? Best friend. What would Ron do? He'd ask his dad. Uh, write to Hermione. What would Hermione do? Go to the library. You know, look it up in a book. Uh, Hagrid? Yeah, it wouldn't be. Dumbledore? Don't want to bother Dumbledore with this. Sirius? I can write to Sirius. What does he not think about? That Sirius Black is still a wanted criminal on the run? No, I think he's still pretty aware of that. Sirius, go Sirius might come out of hiding and come to him. Because later on, he's going to get a note from Sirius. And he's going to jump to what conclusion? If Sirius gets caught, Sirius is a damn fool, right? It's all his fault. Should have stayed in hiding. Nope. If Sirius gets caught, it's, my fault. it's on me. It's my fault. Okay. Which tells us, and this that comes just before, it comes like chapter Mad Eye Moody, Unforgivable Curse is one of those, somewhere up there. Which shows us how well did Harry learn the lesson that Dumbledore taught him at the end of book three. He hasn't learned it at all. Okay. Part of that, not, not the stuff about Wormtail, the stuff about controlling predicting the future because Harry says if Voldemort comes back it'll be all my fault why because I saved Peter Pettigrew if I didn't save Peter Pettigrew Peter Pettigrew wouldn't be able to save Voldemort what is Harry assuming there at the end of book three he heard a prophecy right what was the prophecy servant of the dark lord chained for these past 12 years is going to break free and return to his master. Harry's assuming Peter Pettigrew is the servant of the dark lord. He might not be the one that the prophecy is referring to. Okay? So, the invitation. What invitation does Harry receive? Here it is. Page 27, by the way, that's where we're told that Dudley is roughly now the size and weight of a young killer whale. Okay. <laughs> what invitation does Harry receive? Quidditch World Cup. Quidditch World Cup. How important is the Quidditch World Cup? Kind of like the Super Bowl or the World Cup. No, no, hey, sorry. Within the overall plot of this novel and the story arc, <laughs> it's a plot device. It's just to get people together so things can happen. It's not important. The Quidditch ultimately is not important. Now, how important is Quidditch World Cup within the magical world? You know, we don't understand this in the United States. Sorry for those of you who are sports fanatics. American football, NBA, baseball, nothing for the rest of the world for the most part. What's the number one sport for the rest of the world? Don't say curling. Soccer. Soccer. Football. Soccer in the United States. How important is it? Pretty important. People die at matches. Okay, it happens it, literally every year. People die at matches because I'm a Man U fan, or I'm an Arsenal fan, or I'm a Barcelona fan, and fan is short for what? Fanatic. And if you're a fanatic, you're crazy. And you'll kill people for bad-mouthing your team, okay? So, he gets invited by the Weasleys to go to the Quidditch World Cup. Okay. Molly sends him an invitation. How does it arrive? Curtains of eggs, owls, like a manila sized envelope covered with stamps in one square inch with the address written. Why do the Dursleys go berserk over that? More specifically, Vernon. It's strange and unusual. It's strange and strange and mysterious and they don't hold to anything strange and mysterious okay so arthur fred george and ron all show up to pick up harry 
Flying Forward Anglia? No, that was book two. How do they come? Louder? Fireplace, they use flu powder. Only what's the problem? The Dursleys, like many people, have enclosed their fireplace. Okay, so it's no longer working. So where there would be a fireplace, the wall is. It's not that there's an electric stove plugged in there. It's that there's no longer a space at all. Right? The flu is still in the wall. So they can use flu powder and show up in the space that had been the fireplace, but it's now covered with a wall. So they pop up and they're like this. Okay. What apparently can you not do with a wand? And the only reason I ask it that way is because Arthur Weasley doesn't do this. You can't do your wand like, you know, turn a knob and go, laser. <laughs> you cut a nice little hole in the wall and then put it back and get some, you know, patch and patch it up nicely. What's he do? <coughs> Bombio, you know, explodio or something. He blows a massive hole in the wall. You're Vernon Dursley, and a guy just blows a hole in your living room wall. <laughs> describe your reaction. Not very pleased, because describe the Dursley home. Kitchen, at least, we're told is what? Sterile. Surgically clean. Okay? And now there is wall dust all throughout the living room. So, page 48. Fred, George, Ron, Harry, go get Harry's stuff, his trunk, head rig, etc. Fred, George, Ron, go back through the flu, but not before. George, I think it is, drops something. And here he's getting ready to go back through the flu. He says, page 48, well, by then, and starts to walk towards the now fireplace. And Mr. Weasley stops him, puts his hand up, grabs him by the shoulder. Harry said goodbye to you. Didn't you hear him? Harry, it doesn't matter. Honestly. I don't care. So let go. <laughs> let me go. Mr. Weasley did not remove his hand. You aren't going to see your nephew till next summer, he said to Uncle Vernon in mild indignation. Surely you're going to say goodbye. Describe Mr. Weasley at this point. A little heated. Okay, a little heated. What else? Suspicious. Suspicious. Covered in dust, right? and holding a wand. Look at the next sentence, paragraph. Uncle Vernon's face worked furiously. What does that mean, it worked furiously? It's like, he wants to say something, but he's not sure what he should say. The idea of being taught consideration by a man who had just blasted away half his living room wall seemed to be causing him intense suffering. But, Mr. Weasley's wand was still in his hand, and Uncle Vernon's tiny eyes darted to it once before he said very, very resentfully, goodbye then. Now, notice what we've just been told. From whose perspective is that paragraph told? Or, let me put it this way. We obviously have what's called an omniscient narrator. An omniscient narrator takes you inside the minds of the characters. What have we been told is going on in Vernon's mind? He's wrestling with what? This guy has the goal to teach me consideration. What does that mean, to be taught consideration? We usually think of 
that word consideration in the phrase to be considerate. What's it mean to be considerate? Thinking, thinking about how other people feel. To be thoughtful, to be kind to others, to be empathetic, to identify with them. Okay? But from Vernon's point of view, he's being taught to be considerate of Harry. It's the first time this is kind of brought up. It's going to be brought up in the next three novels. <clears throat> and one of the things, Ro I think at least, one of the things Rowling is doing is I think that by the time she gets around to writing this, she's realizing something about her audience. Her audience isn't just whom? Children. Keep going. True. Adults. Which adults? Parents. parents. It's parents. And Rowling is stepping on a parenting soapbox. Modern parents need to do what? They need to be better at what? Showing consideration for others, how to parent. We're going to get a really, I mean, just bald-faced example, bold-faced example in book six. When Dumbledore comes to pick up Harry, he's going to, I mean, you have Mr. Durst, Mr. Weasley kind of gently put Vernon in his place here. Dumbledore is going to do it not so gently. In fact, he's going to say, you have horribly harmed one of these boys. And they're going to go, oh. And Petunia is going to sit there and wonder, how have I harmed Dudley? I would never harm Dudley. I love Dudley. She loves Dudley too much. If you can imagine loving a child too much. Okay? So Rowling, seems to me at least, from here on out, is going to emphasize several times the idea or ideas of how to be a good parent versus how to be a bad parent. Because we're going to see bad parenting too. And bad parenting often leads to, or can lead to, what? I don't have time. I shouldn't be bringing this up in this part yet, but I will. For just a moment. Dysfunctional families. From here on out, we're going to see this growing. It doesn't become the all-important emphasis, right? But it's going to become a theme that will get larger and larger as we go throughout of functional versus dysfunctional families. What's the greatest functional family in the series? The Weasleys. The Weasleys. Right? Hands down. What characterizes the Weasley family more than anything else? Love. I know, Percy's an ass, okay? And they have to deal with that, and they do deal with it, okay? But everything else, that, that home just, you know, resonates with love. Can you name another family similar to that within the compass of the books? You can't really. And yet they are described how? Lowest of the low. Okay? But then you have dysfunctional families. Dursleys? When you think of Harry being there, are they dysfunctional without Harry? Is there a lot of love between Vernon and Petunia? A lot of love between Vernon, Petunia, and Dudley? Mm. Is that love? Okay. Malfoy's? Riddles? Uh, Snapes? Longbottoms? Just start again, rattling off. And it seems to be an issue. Rolling starts to wrestle with and or raise. Okay? 
And I think part of that, and, and think, you know, dysfunctional doesn't only have to mean the family doesn't get along. Dysfunctional can also mean the family's broken. Like one, life, one living, one dead, so to speak. Or a divorced family. And you're going to hear me, and I'll you know, say it later. Uh, I think that's a lot of Roland's own personal baggage that's finding its way into the books. Especially we will see in book six, where we find out Voldemort's family history, and I'm going to connect it to Rowling's first marriage. Okay? So, Vernon says, goodbye then. Arthur fixes the house. They go back. We get Weasley's wizard wheezes. Fred and George get in trouble for their toffee and such. Um, skipping a bunch. Port key. What's a port key? I know you all know what it is. What's a port key? It's an item that's been magically transformed so that you touch it at a specific time and it'll do what? It becomes a portal. A key to a portal that takes you to somewhere else. Okay? What must you have before you can make a port key? Louder? Like a physical item? A physical item. You know, I chose the bottle. Could be a wallet. Could be a pin. Could be anything. What must you get before you can make one? Permission from the Ministry of Magic. They're kind of like becoming an animagus. You have to get approval, or at the very least, you have to tell the Ministry of Magic. That's why it was so important, you know, the Marauders were all, except for Lupin, you know, became animagi, but never told the Ministry of Magic. We're going to see an illegal port key in the next book, okay? Which is somebody kind of, you know, figuratively thumbing his nose at the Ministry of Magic, as if to say, I don't need to get permission from you. I'm who I am. I can do whatever I, you know, like, well, please. So, they take the port key. I'm skipping a bunch, obviously. They pick, but take the port key to go to the Quidditch World Cup. Who do Mr. Weasley, Fred, George, Ron, Harry, Hermione, not Ginger, Ginny, thank you. She is a ginger, but uh, man, I should just, I should have stopped five minutes into my first class because words aren't working for me today. Um, who do they meet? Amos Diggory and his son, I don't want to put it that way particularly, Cedric, okay? Middle of 72, Mr. Weasley is introducing the Weasley's friends, okay? Merlin's beard! Harry? Harry Potter? Uh, yeah, Harry says. Kind of tired of people doing that, I imagine. Said's talked about you, of course. Told us all about playing against you last year. I said to him, I said, said, that'll be something to tell your grandchildren. That will. You beat Harry Potter. Mm -hmm. Nice little bit of foreshadowing, kind of, you know, by the way. Negative foreshadowing, if you want. Cedric said to him, Harry, Dad, Harry fell off his broom. I told you, it was an accident. Was it an accident? Did Harry fell off his broom? Not really. What caused Harry to fall off his broom? Is okay. Harry just a poor driver, you know, flyer? No, there were like a hundred Dementors looking up at him, okay? Before he figured out how to repel them. Harry fell off his broom, Dad. I told you it was an accident. Yes, but you didn't fall off. Did you, son? Showing fatherly pride. I mean, his son did what? Beat Harry Potter in Quidditch. He can leave the Quidditch part off. 
beat the most famous wizard alive. I mean, you got to admit, Harry's more famous than Dumbledore. Dumbledore didn't defeat Voldemort as a baby. You know, the guy disappears, okay? Always modest, I said. Always the gentleman, but the best man won. What house is Cedric in? Hufflepuff. Hmm. You know, but then isn't it fitting? Because Hufflepuff are losers, right? And who's the first kid to get killed at Hogwarts? Not literally at Hogwarts, but, you know, it's a Hufflepuff. If it had been a Ravenclaw, wouldn't have happened. If it had been a Slytherin, wouldn't have happened. If it had been a Gryffindor, well, it was a Gryffindor, didn't happen, right? Defeated Voldemort yet again. Sorry to give away the ending of book four. So... I'm sure Harry'd say the same. Wouldn't you, eh? Puts Harry on the spot. One falls off his broom, one stays on. Don't need to be a genius to tell which one's the better flyer. And yet we're going to hear in just a few chapters at the first Triwizard task, Ludo Bagman's going to say what about Harry? Great Scott, he can fly. Are you looking at that, Mr. Crumb? Okay, who's the crumb that he's referring to? Victor Crumb, seeker for the Bulgarian international team, professional Quidditch player, and a student. Okay? And he's comparing Harry with him. Hmm. Harry's a pretty good flyer. Gotta imagine what goes through Amos's mind when he hears that, assuming he's at the match. So, they take the port key and they go off to Quidditch World Cup. Chapter Bagman and Crouch. It's somewhere up in Scotland and we see the Roberts family, the, Mr. Roberts owns the field and is kind of managing the thing. We see them go through the campgrounds and little kids play with their daddies and mommy's wands and blowing up slugs and shrinking them back down and you know things like that all those kinds of things that shouldn't be able to happen we get introduced to Ludo Bagman and Barty Crouch Sr. Um, yeah, I'm not going to say any more about them Quidditch World Cup we have the actual cup and 98, Harry's introduced to Winky or meets Winky. Winky talks about Dobby and how Dobby being free is going to his head and such. And then we see 100, 101. So the Weasleys are in their seats and up comes Cornelius Fudge with his guests, the Malfoy family. Bottom of 100. Harry and Draco Malfoy had been enemies ever since their first journey to Hogwarts. Pale boy with a pointed face, white blonde hair, Draco greatly resembled his father. His mother was blonde too, tall and slim. She would have been nice looking if she hadn't been wearing a look that suggested there was a nasty smell under her nose. A little bit of foreshadowing because Harry's going to emphasize this look in a few chapters. So what's she look like? She is pretty, but she has what kind of look? So imagine she's got the horrible smell right on her nose. That's what she looks like, apparently, all the time. So if you could unscrunch her face, you know, smooth out the wrinkles, pull the jaw down a little bit, pull the eyebrows, you go, wow, she's a looker, okay? So... See interaction between Weasley and Malfoy. Seemingly, this is the first interaction they've had since Flourish and Blots in book two. And we find out the Malfoys are there as Fudge's guest. Why? Because they made a large donation to St. Mungo's Hospital for Magical Maladies. St. Mungo, by the way, is the name of an actual Scottish saint. Okay. Rowling loves to do this. She pulls out all these 
names out of history and such. Okay. What else do we get introduced to? Or what else do we see in kind of the pre-game festivities? The Vila. What are Vila? Very, very pretty people. People? Women. Very pretty women. Women. Okay. Gorgeous. What else? What can they do? Yeah, I can ask that. What can they do? And who do they do it to? I had a student in my previous class say they're kind of like the sirens of ancient Greek mythology. Beautiful women who seduce men, but they're not really women. The sirens aren't. They're something else, okay? Um, do they seduce women? Not that we're told it's on, they only have their effect, their spell on men. Okay, just gonna drop that. Um, we see the Quidditch World Cup, which I'm not going to talk at all about because it's not important ultimately. Chapter 9 The Dark Mark Quidditch Cup's over. Everybody's back in their tents for the night. Tomorrow morning, they're going to be leaving, going off to their various places where they live and such. And what do some of the people at the Quidditch World Cup start doing? 118, 119, and following. Is this like what happens after a a big sporting event in the United States, like happened at, at UT Knoxville a couple weeks ago, Knoxville beat Alabama or something like that. And what did the fans do? What no? Riot. Rioted. <laughs> they pulled down the goalposts. And the SEC charged Knoxville, I think it was 500 grand. $100,000. Yeah. It was 100? It was 100. Yeah. yeah. But then they did a fundraiser and raised like. Yeah. And they presented it. The thing is, they were making a big deal about so, it. <laughs> what are they? What are the fans doing there? Blowing off steam, right? Mm -hmm. In one sense. What are these fans doing? Are they blowing off steam? No, they're kind of running for their lives. No. Crowd of wizards, page one nineteen. Tightly packed, moving together with wands pointing straight upwards, marching slowly across the field. Harry squinted at them. They didn't seem to have faces, and then he realized their heads are hooded and their masks. Their masks faced. Their faces masked. Honestly, it's just water. There's nothing else. <laughs> Man. High above them, floating along in midair, four struggling figures were being contorted into grotesque shapes. It was as though the masked wizards on the ground were puppeteers and the people above them were marionettes. And more people are running in and joining this group. Okay. Top of the next page. Suddenly, the floating people are illuminated. And Harry realizes it's Mr. and Mrs. Roberts, the campground owners, and their children. And what does he see Mrs. Roberts start doing? Turning head over heels so that when she turns upside down, her dress falls down over her head, revealing her underwear and such. Ron. Page 120. By the way, that image is going to come up again later of someone being turned upside down and having their underwear revealed. Book six. Okay. Run. That's sick. That's really sick. Is it torture? Yes. Not according to the no. usual definition. Usual definition of torture is the infliction of pain and the infliction of pain causes permanent damage now it could be permanent damage like taking a cigar cutter cutting a finger off and doing it again and again and again or jamming you know as was done in the vietnam war bamboo or world war ii bamboo shoots under the fingernails or pulling the fingernails off the fingernails grow back so that's not permanent 
the pain up here probably does stick around for a while. Is Mrs. Roberts being tortured? No, not strictly. What is being harmed in her? Her sense of pride, her sense of dignity, her sense of honor, her sense of decorum, all those kinds of things. Okay? Is it cruel? Yes. Is it unusual? Yes. Is it horrible? Yes. Okay? So, Mr. Weasley, Bill, Charlie say, we've got to go help. They run off. They tell Harry, Harry, Ron, Hermione, Ginny, go off to the woods. Okay? So they do. They run into Malfoy. Malfoy says some unnice things about Hermione. Ron tells him to shut his mouth, etc. And they go into a clearing. Okay? Page 128. They get into the clearing, and Harry thinks he hears something behind the, in the woods. Hello? Silence. Harry gets to his feet, because they've been sitting. He looks around the tree. He doesn't see anything. Who's there? No response. And then suddenly, they hear a voice. Unlike any they had heard in the wood, it uttered not a panic shout, but what sounded like a spell. More's more dread. Something big and green goes up through the trees and takes the shape of a giant skull composed out of like emeralds in the sky with a snake coming out of its mouth. Okay. Has Harry seen anything like this before? Chamber of Secrets. The entrance to, not the entrance to the bathroom, down once you get into whatever that place is. And there, before the doors were, what's above the doors? It's a skull with a snake coming out. Okay? What's the snake actually there? It's the basilisk. Anyways, what the, says Ron, as the thing had appeared. Harry hears the noise again. He hears screams. Who's there? Hermione goes, come on, Harry, let's move. What's the matter? It's the dark mark, Harry. You know whose sign. Voldemort's? Come on. Harry turns to move, and all of a sudden, and in an instant, Harry realizes surrounding he, Ron, and Hermione are about 20 wizards in a circle. Harry, Ron, and Hermione at the middle. And we're told without pausing to think, Harry yells duck and drops to the ground. Leaves Ron and Hermione to fend for themselves, right? No. He pulls them down. And what do the wizards all do? Okay. Think of their formation again. What would this be called in the real world? And they didn't have wands, but they had rifles. Terrorist Not a terrorist attack necessarily. It's a circular firing squad. What's the problem with the circular firing squad? There's so many terrorists. Yeah. Because the targets of the circular firing squad have dropped to the ground. So now... And yet, what doesn't happen? They don't stun each other. So I asked my first class. I never thought about this until this morning. So I asked my first class. It'd be like if I had you stand up here, and you stand up here or in the back, and I'm aiming at you. Can I like put a turn a dial on my wand so that the spell only goes a certain number of feet, and then it just stops? And not that we're told. So why does person one here not shoot person ten across the clearing? Maybe all their spells collided in the center after they duck. Maybe shielding <laughs> Are they somehow at the same time firing a spell and throwing up another spell simultaneously? Mm. To me, it's a problem. 
if they're if they're in a circle, at least one of them ought to be dropping down stunned, and none of them are. Okay. Anyways, so you have all these wizards. Okay. They talk about the dark mark. Arthur says, "Stop! That's my son." You know. They realize it's Harry, and they ask, "You know, who conjured the dark mark?" We don't know. Okay. Who gets um, captured? Winky. Winky. Who's Winky? A house elf. Crouch's house elf. Okay. And Amos says, a bit embarrassing, page 132. Arthur's like, come off it, Amos. You don't seriously think it was the elf. He said, you know, she had a wand. But look, she's got a wand, okay? So, page 134, Diggory says, the elf, the dark mark, was conjured here a short while ago. You were discovered moments later, right beneath it, beneath it, an explanation. What's Amos Diggory doing? He's applying logic to the situation. There was a dark mark. Here's an elf. The elf had a wand. The dark mark, pretty close proximity to the elf. What does logic dictate? Probably the elf. What's the problem with that for one of the people in the circle? It's Barty Crouch's elf. Okay. What do we know about Barty Crouch at this point? What's his job? He's like the American head of the International or of the American Olympic Committee. Ooh. We're going to find out what about him, though. He'd once been next in line for... Minister of Magic. He, like, if Fudge hadn't gotten it, it would have been Barty Crouch Sr. Okay? We don't know why he didn't get it, or we don't know that yet. So we're going to hear page 136. Mr. Diggory yells, You've been caught red-handed, Elf, caught with the guilty wand in your hand, right? Because what did they make the wand that Winky was holding do? It would be a little last though. Priori incantatum, it becomes the title of a chapter later in the book, all right? And it's where the wand spits out its last spell. And they see a little dark mark come out of the wand. It's Harry's wand, all right? Where did Winky get it? Harry dropped it. Harry. Or no. Someone else dropped it. Where did Winky get it? This is why I'm asking. Winky says, I found it. Here. In the woods. When did Harry lose it? When they first went into the woods. Did he? He lost it more by the fence with the lady in front of him. Harry says, I don't know. He doesn't know if he lost it when they went into the woods. Might he have lost it earlier, like during the Quidditch World Cup? Remember when they go up and they do their seating? There's an empty seat, right? Hmm. So, Mr. Crouch says, uh, excuse me, Arthur Weasley says, Amos, think about it. Precious few wizards know how to do that spell. Where would she have learned it? So Arthur is taking Amos Diggory's logic to its next logical step or conclusion. If she did it, she had to learn how to do it. That means someone would have to have taught her. What do we know about house elves? They're loyal to their masters. Are they loyal to their masters? They're enslaved to their masters. They don't get a leave their masters without permission. Now we do see 
Winky at the Quidditch World Cup holding a seat, okay? Because she's been commanded to do that. Page 136 again. Aim, um, Crouch takes Arthur's statement and goes to the next logical step from there. He infers from Arthur's statement. Perhaps Amos is suggesting that I routinely teach my servants to conjure the dark mark. And everybody just goes, and there's silence. I, I, Mr. Crouch, no, no, not at all. Why doesn't he call him Barty? Okay, why doesn't he call him Bartimius? What are we what are we being given an indication of here? Uh, higher imbalance. Higher power imbalance. A hierarchy. Where's Mr. Crouch on the hierarchy? He's above Amos. Okay. You have now come very close to accusing the two people in this clearing who are least likely to conjure the dark mark or that mark. Harry Potter and myself. I suppose you're familiar with the boy story, Amos. Why does he ask that question? Basically being like, do you really think that there's an defeat of Voldemort will conjure the dark mark? That's the implication. But he's implying something else about Amos. You stupid dolt. <laughs> you do know who this is, right? And you do know what he did. Uh, of course, everyone knows. So, you know it wasn't Harry. And I trust you remember the many proofs I have given over a long career that I despise and detest the dark arts, dark arts and those who practice them. Are we told what, how do we put it? What those many proofs are? or we're not yet. We're going to see them actually later. We're not going to hear them. We're going to have Harry experience them. Okay? Or at least one of them. I, I, I never suggested you had anything to do with it. Notice, that's your inf inference of what I said. Right? I said, I didn't imply anything. If you accuse my elf, you accuse me. She might have picked it up anywhere. Uh, yeah, that's the point. <laughs> and that's uh, Crouch's whole point. Arthur Weasley, precisely, Amos. She might have picked it up anywhere. In other words, just because she was holding the wand that performed the magic doesn't mean she was the one who performed the magic. And what proof are we going to be given later? I think Harry, Ron, and Hermione are talking, and they might be talking with Mr. Weasley. My memory is not exactly clear on this. And they're going to say what? The voice that we heard say the dark mark, or say the spell, it was a deep male voice. It was a winky's high squeaky voice. Okay. So, the Weasleys go back to their tent and such. And Barty Crouch sacks Winky. Hermione gets all upset. Page 142. Ron says, top of the page, I don't get it. I mean, it's only a shape in the sky. Talking about the dark mark. Why doesn't Ron get it? Or let me rephrase that. What it suggests, what... What is Rowling suggesting, not his, what is suggesting Rowling, what is Rowling suggesting about the dark mark? It's not talked about. Okay, what else? What is the dark mark, first of all? I don't mean describe it. What kind of thing is it? it starts with an S. Symbol. It's a symbol. What is she saying about symbols? Symbols have power, right? Ron 
who's never seen the dark mark, who's never read about the dark mark, what does it mean for him? Nothing. Nothing. It'd be like one of you coming in and starting to speak to the rest of us. Okay? I'm going to use a language that none of you know, but I'm positive none of you know. Come in speaking what is called Proto-Indo-European. Everyone in this room would go, somebody started drinking a little early. Because <laughs> we wouldn't have any idea what you're talking about. Okay? Or it would be like if I walked into a room of the American Atheist Society, I just made that up by the way, you know, and you know, held this out to show them, what would they immediately say? Yeah. Oh, you're superstitious, you believe in some guy who died on a cross, big freaking deal. It would mean absolutely nothing. But to other Christians, it does mean something. It's like, you know, if I can remember how to draw it, it's like this thing on the back of a car. It's supposed to be a fish. And what do a lot of people put on them today? You know, put some legs, and it says then Darwin. Okay? Belittling. <laughs> What's the significance of this? Because, uh, the it was a symbol used by early Christians to indicate <clears throat> I'm a Christian. Why was it used by early Christians? When Christianity was not just an illegal outlawed religion, but one that if you were known to be a member of, you died. Okay? So it's kind of a you know the secret handshake kind of a thing, all right? That's what the dark mark is. And what Rowling is suggesting is symbols have power. What's the dark mark's equivalent in our world? Swastika. That's what a lot of people said. The swastika. Okay? Not really. Why? This image predates Hitler by 3,000 years. You know what it is, actually? It's what the swastika piece, represents? Is it peaceable for Hinduism or Buddhism? No, it's even oh. it precedes that. It's a sunburst. I, I don't quite get that personally because it's kind of crooked. <laughs> I've never seen sun's rays go, you know, unless they bounce off water. Rainbow, okay. Um, what would be another example? Be they use kind of the um, they not really they use the um, the German oh, yeah. the SS okay oh. skull and crossbones really? what's the skull and crossbones represent today Pirates? what's it used for no death. specifically right. what kind of death you see it on items go buy a gallon of leech Oh, okay. Poison. It's used to indicate poison. Okay, that's kind of what this stands as. All right, or you know, you could use this also. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> or the three interlocking things for nuclear. You know, there's nuclear radiation, that kind of stuff here. So, Mr. Weasley explains. Ron, you know who and his followers sent the dark mark into the air whenever they killed? So that implies it was only used when somebody's been killed. Did anybody die at the Quidditch World Cup? No. no. So why was it used? Hmm. Terror and inspired. You have no idea. First time this is used in the books, by the way. You're too young. They're 14 now. Okay. You're too young. Their first lesson with Mad-Eye Moody, he's going to tell them, boy, you guys are way behind in curses. Now, the Ministry of Magic says I should only teach you counter curses. But Dumbledore thinks you're better than that. Dumbledore thinks you're old enough for the real stuff. So I'm going to teach you the unforgivable curses. Okay? Implying Dumbledore is at odds with the Ministry for Magic. Later than that, we're going to have the three of them meet up with Sirius at Hogsmeade. And Sirius is going to start to talk about some bad stuff, and he's going to say, well, you wouldn't understand, you're too young. 
And I think it's Ron that's going to say, you know, I'm tired of hearing we're too young. The series kind of goes, yes. <laughs> Kid after my own heart. Rabble rouser. <laughs> like little marauders, you know. So, just picture coming home and finding the dark mark hovering over your house and knowing what you're about to find inside. Everyone's worst fear. Was or was not the dark mark seen over Harry Potter's house the night his parents were killed? See, there's something nagging in my mind. I've not, I've not reread the last three books recently. I will before we go over them. That someone alludes to it was seen. Okay? But I'm not positive. So it's probably by, since I can't speak anymore, it's probably my memory going too. Um, so there's silence. Bill says, it didn't help us. We don't know who conjured it. Scared the Death Eaters away. Harry, Death Eaters? What are Death Eaters? It's what you know whose supporters called themselves. Okay, stop for a minute. Don't Harry and Ron both seem a little dense here? Or uneducated here? Shouldn't they know a little bit about this? I mean, how long ago was Voldemort and his rise to power? 13 years ago. It wasn't that long. I mean, Voldemort was at the height of his power 14 years ago. That's not that long. You guys have at least heard of 9-11, right? Okay, so that's kind of the equivalent. Because people were dropping like flies when Voldemort was in power. Anyways, Hermione knows, but then Hermione reads everything. So, it's what you know who supporters called themselves. So they talk about who the Death Eaters were and why they might have been out and stuff. And Harry asks, top of 143, I mean, what was the point? What was the point of doing that to the Robertses? Mr. Weasley says with a hollow laugh, the point? Harry, that's their idea of fun. Half the mogul killings back when you knew who was in power were done for fun. I suppose they had a few drinks tonight. Couldn't resist reminding us all. Lots of them are still at large. Why does Rowling include that statement? They did it for fun. To show how To give us an indication of how bad the Death Eaters are. They killed for fun. What does that tell us about them? Psychopaths, sociopaths, what else? They are evil. Okay? Totally speculation here. Do you think when Harry hears that, that he possibly thinks of growing up with the Dursleys? Are the Dursleys evil? No, the mean SOBs, but they're not evil. Would Dudley, if he had the opportunity, take Harry outside and kill him? No, he wouldn't. Would he take him outside and beat the living daylights out of him? Yes, he would, if he had the opportunity. Okay? Here's a question. Would Draco take Harry outside and kill him if he had the opportunity? Just, just let that hang, okay? So, Ron, if they were the Death Eaters, why'd they disappear? Wouldn't they be happy to see that? Bill says, use your brains, Ron. Well, that's not very nice. <laughs> Older brother, younger brother, you know, putting him down. But why does he say that? All of these people are out here and free. Why? Because they didn't get sent to Azkaban. Why didn't they get sent to Azkaban? If they're real Death Eaters, we're assuming these are all real Death Eaters, okay? They got out of it. They got out of it somehow. They didn't get caught, or they denounced, him. They denounced Voldemort. 
they may have lied and said, oh, I was under the imperious curse. As we're going to hear, a lot of people did. Okay. In which case they then denounced Voldemort, which we're going to see at the end of book five. We're going to hear about some that did that. So, mayhem at the ministry. What's the mayhem? Why are there problems with the ministry of magic? Um, I'm news journalist reading Skeeter. It's we get introduced to Rita Skeeter. Okay. Who spoke to her? Uh, Rita Skeeter spoke to Voldemort. Yeah. Voldemort spoke to Rita Skeeter. Who spoke to her? Arthur. Without what? What did Arthur not have permission to do? Speak to the press. Okay. By the way, by bringing in Rita Skeeter, Rowling is introducing another theme or issue, if you want, that's going to go throughout the remaining four books, this one and the other three. What is that theme or issue? Anybody know? Louder? I thought somebody said something. I said media. What about the media? It, they over exaggerate or they lie. They lie. It's not objective. It's not true. What do we come to find out about Rita Skeeter? She's kind of like a gossip, or she is a gossip girl almost. She loves to make things up and cause drama. She invents quotes. There have been, I don't know how many cases in the last 20 years. Uh, there's a guy who won a Pulitzer Prize. Had it taken back because it turned out he invented quotes. There was a famous reporter for both the New York Times and another reporter for the Wall Street Journal. Both got fired after it was discovered. Major stories that they wrote were entirely false. Sources were false. The whole nine yards. Okay, Rowling is kind of raising the idea. How do you know what you read or hear in the press is true? And we're going to see her really bring that up in book five because she introduces us to another form of the press. What's the press we've heard about so far in books one through three? The Daily Prophet. The Daily Prophet. What's the Daily Prophet's equivalent in our world? Newspaper. What? Give me, name one. New York Times. New York Times. Washington Post. Chicago Tribune. L.A. Times. Miami Herald. Those are all big, USA Today, big, major, large market newspapers. Okay? If we were in England, it would be the Times of London or the Guardian, or the Independent, all right? What's the quibbler in this world? Harry Potter world, not our world. A tabloid. It's a tabloid. So what's the real world equivalent, let's say, in the United States? National, National Enquirer is the number one most people think, okay? In Britain, it's the Sun, the Daily Star, the Daily Mirror, things like that, okay? The kind of things that you're at the checkout line, you can read, you know. Taylor Swift, actually from Pluto, or Elvis is still alive, or nonsense like all of those, right? And yet it's going to be in the quibbler that we're going to read some real stories. That is truth. And I think part of that is because she's going, damn. Damn. I can no longer really just pick on the major media because sometimes the tabloids have the truth. 2004, United States, don't have time for this. The National Enquirer broke a major, major story. Anybody know what it was? Uh. It was about a person, a major American politician who'd been discovered cheating on his wife, who was dying of cancer at the time. Actually, I think it was a year after. I think it was 2005. Anybody know who I'm talking about? John Edwards, vice presidential candidate with John Kerry, the presidential candidate. 
The major media, New York Times, Washington Post, they knew about it. They didn't want to touch it. Why? They didn't want to bring down, quote unquote, their candidate. But the National Enquirer said, deal with this, <laughs> we're gonna print it, and did, okay? Same kind of thing happened, by the way, 96. Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton. Who broke that? It wasn't a tabloid per se. A drudge report. All the major media outlets had it. Drudge heard about it and put it up on it. The drudge report was new, like a year old. Aggregator of news. Drudge put it up and then nobody else could ignore it. Okay, and we got introduced to Monica Lewinsky. Okay, so. Arthur's in the hot seat, so to speak. Who's defending the ministry in that chapter? Percy. Why? Because he, he now works there. Well, his dad does. So here, the snot-nosed punk new graduate, okay, telling his father, essentially, who's been working for the ministry for years, you shouldn't have done that. <laughs> why, why do we get that scene? Why are we told that about Percy? Tells us where his loyalty is. His loyalty is to whom? Slash what? Not Fudge, more particularly, Bartinius Crouch Sr., his boss, but via him to the ministry of magic no matter what. He's a ministry man through and through, to use a phrase, to paraphrase, a phrase that's going to come up later on in book six, okay? So, they get on the Hogwarts Express, Harry over here, Harry, Ron, Hermione over here, a conversation of Malfoy with Crabbe and Goyle talking about his father wanted him to go to Durmstrang where the headmaster actually has the students learn dark arts, not just defense against the dark arts. So they learn how to do dark art magic, okay? But mother wanted him to stay nearby. Yeah, hmm, why? Why the hmm? What's it tell us about Draco? He's not his father, and his mother knows that. Okay, what else? Thought you were gonna say it. He's a mama's boy. It's not the Great, fearsome, you know, okay? Durmstrang, the phrase, the name, comes from a German phrase, Sturm und Drang, okay? It's a phrase that relates to 19th century, largely Germanic, but also other literature, romantic literature, Gothic literature. Not romantic, you know, like Harlequin romances, people running off and falling. No. There is an element of that. It means storm and stress. Okay? Sturm, storm, drunk, and stress. In this kind of literature, you often have you know, literal storms all throughout the stories. Showing that the, the weather world is in chaos, and that has effect on the people. The greatest example kind of in English literature is Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte, where you have a lover his dead beloved, who's a ghost, okay? And it all occurs on the Scottish moors. And it's all very atmospheric, okay? In German, probably Goethe's Faust would be the best example, okay? And what happens, and you have characters just kind of put in a pressure cooker. And the storm and stress, you know, makes them do things they may not otherwise have done. It's kind of telling us what Durmstrang is like. Okay. So, Tri Wizard Tournament chapter. And we get the second Sorting Hat song. The first Sorting Hat song was in Harry, 
Was it in Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone? I don't think that's right. There was one in the Harry Potter. It's a real short one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think it is. It's kind of if you're familiar with Veggie Tales, it's kind of like a stupid little Veggie Tales silly song, right? This one's a little bit deeper. The one we'll hear in book five. Oh, that's a lot. Introduces more problems. So, a thousand years or more ago, when I was, yeah, I don't have time to do all that because I want to get as far as. Um, so what do we discover? You have these four founders, and we were told where they live, right? Gryffindor from Wild Moor. The moor is the highlands of Scotland, right? Fair Ravenclaw from Glen. A glen is a narrow river valley, you know, steep hillsides, river at the bottom. Sweet Hufflepuff from Valley Broad, kind of like where we are now, between the Smokies way to the east and I don't know what way to the west, um, hillside, you know. In shrewd Slytherin from Finn. What's a Finn? Swamp. We don't use the word Finn in America. We call it either swamp or marsh. Yeah, usually swamp. Because swamp implies more of what we want here. Mosquitoes, bugs, nasty, foul, stinky. That's where Slytherins come from, essentially. Okay? So, they come up with an idea to start a school. And we're told... Each of the four founders value different virtues. So, we go in this order. Gryffindor values the bravest. Ravenclaw, the cleverest. Hufflepuff, the hard workers. Slytherin, ambition. One of those characteristics isn't a virtue, though. Being clever isn't a virtue. You're either born clever or you're not. Can you learn more stuff? Yes, you can. You can pack all kinds of more knowledge in. But clever, smart, so to speak, that's a quality you're born with. You're not born necessarily brave. You develop bravery or cowardice. You're not born a coward either. Hard work, that's something that's inculcated in you. Okay? Ambition, same thing. It's kind of interesting that this is being considered a Virtue. So, how they decide to divide the houses once they're all dead and gone? We're told Gryffindor came up with the idea. He pulled his hat off, and they each put a bit of their brains in. Not literally. We're probably... It's implied maybe high with... Uh, uh, possibly implied later with something we get introduced to in... I think in this book. Something that Dumbledore has in his office. Okay? So they put their brains in it. Only reason I'm emphasizing this is because we're going to be told in book six when Harry and Dumbledore are going off looking for relics of the four founders that there's only one relic of Gryffindor around. And we've already been introduced to it. It's the sword of God of Gryffindor. But it's not right. Because this is the other relic. How? How does Rowling not remember that? Okay? So, Triwizard Tournament, Dumbledore mentions. We get introduced to the house elves at Hogwarts. And what does Hermione do? Wait, 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 wait. You mean slaves? are making this food, and Ron's sitting there just stuffing as much as he can down his pellet. Right? Okay. And slaves do what else? House elves. They clean up the food. How does it magically just disappear, right? It doesn't just poof when you're done. It's because there's a house elf there. Invisible. House elves don't need invisibility gloves, right? Okay. What else do the house elves do? They do the laundry, they clean the dormitories, they clean the bedrooms. 
They do all the grunt stuff. So Hermione creates. Say it again. Spew. Spew. It's the greatest acronym, okay? I think. And yet, we'll stop with this. What does Rowling do with Spew after this book? Makes fun of it. Kind of makes fun of it? Drops it. There's really, ultimately, Hermione drops the whole emphasis on the enslavement of house elves. Other than her emphasis on creature being treated properly. Okay? But freeing house up, she drops it entirely. And I think it's because Rowling maybe comes to a realization she opened a can of worms and she's in a Pandora's box that she's not going to be able to close. Okay, We'll talk about that more later. All right, so we're going to pick up, tell you, uh, I'm going to not talk about Moody there. We're going to pick up on pages 204 and following where we see Malfoy transformed into a ferret. <laughs> I know you don't like the movies, but that scene is really funny. Well, that, that, it's really funny. Who remember that scene being funny? Malfoy gets what he has coming. 